Corey, thank you very much for inviting me. Because it's the age of immunotherapy, this is the largest audience I've ever spoken to at one of these meetings, so I appreciate you all staying. <clears throat> so I asked Corey, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, we're in the immunotherapy age. Tell them what's going on beyond PD-1. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to review with you little or no clinical data, because there aren't any. I'm also asked to anticipate the future, which is not easy. But I do want to be practical. And you'll see in the middle, I want to help you answer the questions your patients will have about some of the immune therapies they read about. This is an area of almost astonishing complexity. And so I think you will benefit from hearing three speakers, you've heard two already, come to this from a slightly different perspective with differing presentation styles. And it is very obvious that figuring all of this out um, is not going to be easy. So I'm going to talk about some novel engineered antibodies, mainly by way of telling you that lung cancer is going to be a lot more difficult than CLL. I'm going to talk about some very strange therapeutic vaccines, <clears throat> some of which are showing efficacy in other cancers. And I'm going to try to answer the question, when, if ever, will there be cellular therapies for lung cancer? So I want to first talk about some of these novel antibodies. So we have heard uh, that some of these FC receptor polymorphisms in humans drive the responsiveness to agents we all know about, such as rituximab. And patients who have the good genotype have a higher response rate. I will also acknowledge that there are equivocal outcomes when you try to look at trastuzumab and cetuximab and cross them with these polymorphisms. That said, there are a number of engineering strategies that attempt to take advantage of this by enhancing <coughs> the monoclonal antibody FC binding to the activating receptors, decreasing interactions with the inhibitory receptors, and coming up with antibodies that increase uh, uh, CDC activity via increased C1Q binding. And all of this falls under the rubric of glycoengineering, uh, because we've learned that the type of carbohydrates in uh, the FC receptor drive the affinity for, uh, in, in the FC portion of the antibody, drive the affinity for the receptor. And it has to do with fucose residues, because if you don't have fucose residues, you have increased efficacy. And there, in fact, is an FDA-approved monoclonal antibody for CLL called opinotuzumab that is a defucosylated antibody for CLL uh, that is used in the treatment of that disease. So this is an antibody that we have worked on um, at Penn, and you'll see that there are some other institutions participating as well, that is made by a company called Macrogenics called MGA271, that is a first-in-class antibody that uses these principles. So it's a humanized IgG1 FC-optimized antibody specifically designed to increase ADCC. It has a very interesting target, as I'll show you in the next slide, called B7H3, which is a member of this large B7 immune regulatory family, although it doesn't appear to have any immune regulatory function by itself. It is a target of convenience. It has a good therapeutic index because it's found on tumor cells, but not on normal cells. And the antibody has multiple potential complementary mechanisms of action by uh, it's the fact that it's an IgG1. And a broad range of tumors happen to express this particular target, including about 50 or 60 percent of lung cancers. OK, help me here. Next slide, please. This is the B7 family. You've heard a lot about PD-1, PDL one Here's B7H3. You'll notice that there's a question mark here. Its interactions with the T cells are mysterious and poorly characterized. But this is the target, and it is, bio, it is at least uh, related protein sequence-wise to some of these other members of the family. But as I told you, this is not immune targeting per se. This is a target of convenience. Help me here again. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And so the phase one study that has now morphed into a phase 1B study initially looked at dose escalation to determine a recommended phase two dose, which we now have, with a variety of expansion cohorts in six different diseases, including bladder, melanoma, 
triple negative breast cancer, head and neck cancer, and adenocarcinoma and squamous cell cancer uh, of lung. And the data were presented at the SITC meeting um, about a week ago. And what I can tell you so far is that the antibody is very well tolerated, but we are not seeing objective responses. So the strategy for this antibody going forward is going to be to combine it with other agents. I next want to talk about DNA-based immunotherapy. Now, you heard in one of the prior presentations all of the different problems with therapeutic vaccines. And I'm going to show you a slide later that summarizes those problems yet again. But there's one very interesting category of therapeutic vaccine that has partially been validated in the real world. And that has to do with uh, DNA vaccines that are based upon plasmids. And so there are some recent technical breakthroughs, specifically electroporation, that have allowed them to become immunogenic. Plasmid DNA vaccines can be cheaply made in very large scale. They are quite stable. And here's the key information. So these antibodies are being used in HPV-related cervical cancer. They are able to induce robust CD8-positive T-cell reactivity in subjects getting the uh, vaccine compared to those who receive placebo. And in a recent article that was published this fall in The Lancet, there is this remarkable observation that women with SYN2 and 3 pre, uh, neoplastic lesions of the cervix either resolve to uh, SYN1 or no disease in about half of the women treated with the vaccine compared to a, a lower percentage of women receiving placebo. So we're making a cancerous lesion go away with four doses of a therapeutic vaccine with a very favorable safety profile consisting of injection site reactions. These plasmids can easily be combined into polyvalent vaccine cocktails. Next slide. So at the University of Pennsylvania, we're approaching this with telomerase. So telomerase is an attractive target because it's very tumor specific, expressed in a lot of solid tumors, including lung cancer. It is immunogenic, recognized by cytotoxic T cells, and when it is recognized, it can mediate tumor cell death. Um, it is associated with the natural history of the disease. So if you happen to be a cancer patient who has CD8 cells that are positive for HTERT, uh, you tend to be in remission. There's an important caveat here. This is not the first time this has been targeted. There's been a peptide-based vaccine, two different clinical trials, large clinical trials, and advanced pancreatic cancer that were negative. Next slide. Here's the drug. It is a cocktail composed of two different pep, uh, plasmids. So one of them expresses H-TERT, and the other expresses an adjuvant, IL-12. And so these two plasmids are combined. The plasmids have been engineered in ways that enhance the transcription and translation of proteins in cells, as you'll see in a moment. Next slide. And here's the weird stuff. Um, <clears throat> so this is injected into people by electroporation. So anybody who uh, did transfections, either as an undergraduate or a graduate student or a postdoc, knows about shocking cells in order to get the DNA to go into them and be expressed. So that's what we're doing with people. So this is an intramuscular injection with electroporation, electrical pulses, uh, somewhat similar to those that are used to shock somebody in AFib, back to normal sinus rhythm, increase the delivery of these plasmids by more than a thousand fold. This is the device, the box. Uh, and this was really the key theoretical breakthrough that allowed these DNA vaccines to become immunogenic. And so the device consists of the box, and then there's this gun, which is white, uh, so it's a little bit less threatening. It's got this array that goes into the patient's deltoid muscle. Then there's a channel in the middle uh, through which this syringe is injected, and this shows uh, it's not me, but it could be me injecting these uh, DNA vaccines into the patient. But I have to have somebody on the other side of me to hold the patient's arm because the three pulses that are generated will cause the arm to jerk, and then we're done. Next slide, please. 
And so this is what's happening biologically. So here's the syringe, the DNA vaccine in green that's going in, the electrical pulses. The pulses open up these pores. The pores allow the DNA to go in. The DNA goes in. It then gets transcribed into proteins, into the antigen of choice. The immune system then responds in lymph nodes generating antibody and uh, T cells directed towards the antigen. Next slide, please. And so this is the design of the trial. Um, the purpose of the trial and the hypothesis of the trial is that this therapy will be immunogenic and generate robust T cell immunity, that it will also be safe. I want you to notice that there are just four injections. So this does not go on for a year. Four injections every four weeks. It's a dose escalation trial for patients with breast, lung, or pancreatic cancer who have completed definitive therapy and are nominally cured, but who are considered to be at high risk, who don't, uh, are not on immunosuppressive therapy or steroids. It's going to be a fairly large trial with objectives of safety and secondary immunological objectives to see whether this generates the desired immune response. And patients will be followed for up to two years, both for safety as well as persistence of immunogenicity. Next slide. What about all the other lung cancer vaccines? The bad news is, and you heard about two of these already, but in fact there are three, uh, large-scale uh, protein, peptide, and cell-based vaccines with very colorful names, including Start and Stop, that have all been resoundingly negative. And you heard a number of reasons why these clinical trials might have failed. The good news is that in addition to the DNA vaccines that I just told you about, there are a number of new strategies and new vaccines all of which have the same themes, which is to dramatically expand the antigen repertoire as well as a variety of engineering and adjuvanting strategies to get a better CD8 positive response. And the desire is to have all of these vaccines be off the shelf so we don't want them to look like Cipulis LT that are highly customized and extremely expensive. And I'm not supposed to talk about checkpoint inhibitors, but there's obviously an opportunity to combine these with checkpoint inhibitors. Next slide. And so this is just a list of some of the vaccines that are in active clinical trials as we speak. And I just want to point out that what they all have in common is a desire to expand the antigen repertoire to which patients are being exposed by use of multiple cell lines or a cell line that's expressing multiple antigens combined with a novel adjuvant, GP96. Um, this is an interesting vaccine. I'm not sure that I want you to give me a dribble vaccine, but it has a colorful name with more than 25 cancer antigens, plus some novel uh, toll-like receptor adjuvants, um, and on and on. So these are some of the vaccines that are being explored in clinical trials that are trying to move well beyond the, the very monotonic vaccines that have failed in clinical trials so far. <clears throat> and. This is a, a theoretical slide, and you've heard a little bit about this before, but this is the advantage, I think, of hearing a different perspective on the same problem. So about half of patients getting PD-1 therapies don't respond. And a highly simplistic view of why they don't respond is that if you're going to take the brakes off the immune system, and if something's going to happen, there has to be an engine there. Uh, and the engine is these TIL cells. And so patients can be roughly grouped into those who have TIL cells and those who don't, those who express PDL1 and those who don't. And if there's a responder phenotype, this is what it looks like. And so the challenge is to get these patients to look like this. Um, and how can that occur? Next slide, please. So one of the, the goals is to convert tumors from low TILs to high TILs. And so this is a tumor, and it's got some cancer stem cells and T cells in it. But here's your metastatic tumor, which is merrily growing along because it doesn't have any TIL cells in it. And if you take this tumor and hit it with high-dose ablative radiation therapy, you change the tumor microenvironment in ways that are yet to be fully characterized. But among other things, you're probably generating neoantigens. And that then allows T cells to then recognize uh, and attack and get into the metastatic tumor. And there are trials referred to colloquially as RADVAX that are specifically designed to do that. I mentioned that there are some drug companies working on small molecules to enhance T cell trafficking and also obviously therapeutic tumor vaccines to prime the immune response represents another strategy. Next slide, please. 
I am going to conclude by talking about T-cell therapies. This is an area that I think you need to know something about with respect to lung cancer because you're going to get asked questions about it because it has been in the news. And the next slide shows you the question that you're going to ask. So I have been asked this question by more than one patient. Patients have said to me, doctor, I want you to give me what she got. And she got CTL-19, which is a cellular therapy that's directed against a B cell antigen. And so I tried explaining that to some of my patients, and the answer was, well, doctor, it worked for her. Why don't you just try it? What have I got to lose? So I need to explain what these cells are, how they are generated, and why that particular statement is not true, and also present to you, talk about some of the evident challenges in turning the therapy that put her into remission into a useful therapy for patients with lung cancer. Next slide, please. So the rationale for targeted therapy is that it could, at least in theory, overcome the limitations of conventional immunotherapy with monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, and the like. And so the idea is to genetically modify a patient's own T cells with redirected specificity to tumor antigens that could allow you to get the specificity of antibody therapy. You can get a catalytic amplified response because these cells go into the patient and they stay there. They might even replicate, divide, expand, um, allowing them to turn into uh, killer cells for quite some time. And if, uh, as well, there is also the opportunity to get some durable memory activity that might help lead to a prolonged remission. There have been two general strategies. One of them is TIL cells that you've heard about, and you read these papers starting in the 1980s coming out of the NIH from Dr. Rosenberg lab, taking tumors from a patient, expanding them ex vivo, and infusing them back into the patient as a therapy. The new way is very different, and that's to genetically manipulate the T cells to either express an engineered T cell receptor or an antibody fragment, as I'll show you in a moment, that recognizes a tumor-derived antigen. And then what you do is expand these ex vivo and infuse them into patients. Next slide, please. And so the engineering process here to generate these CARs, so these are synthetic engineered receptors designed to target molecules on tumor cells is that the antigen binding domain is typically derived from a monoclonal antibody, and it is then attached to stimulatory domains that are borrowed from the body, um, including molecules such as 4,1-BB and the CD3 zeta chain, to generate this uh, synthetic receptor um, on T cells that can recognize tumor cells, activate the T cell, and kill them, or kill the tumors. Next slide, please. Fast forward, or just go forward one notch, please. Keep going. Keep going. Now go backwards now one more time. All right, so at the University of Pennsylvania, lentiviral vectors are used to achieve this gene transfer um, to create these T cells with the desired specificity to take advantage of their cytotoxic potential. Next slide, please. And so how is this done? T cells are harvested from the patient. They are then expanded um, ex vivo in the presence of these antibodies that have stimulatory molecules on them to allow them to expand and activate. Um, this process takes approximately two weeks. The stimulatory beads are removed. This generates a product in a very small bag um, that contains these CAR T cells that have this engineered receptor on them. Um, and then this is infused into the patient um, and these tumor cell or these T cells then circulate and in theory can recognize, attack, uh, and destroy cancer cells. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of very important challenges with this therapy, and I just want to talk about the most important one first. Antigen selection is an enormous problem when you're trying to treat lung cancer. So you have to find an antigen with expression that clearly demarcates tumor from normal. And there are not many proteins on the surface of cancer cells that are also not shared in some way with normal cells. And there's this idea of tissue expendability. So the reason that Emma Whitehead can get uh, a therapy directed against B cells that will destroy every single B cell in her body, including her leukemic cells, is that you can live with B cell aplasia because you can get IVIG. 
Uh, and you actually don't need your prostate gland in order to live, so that's a good target as well. But the function of most of our solid organs, like lungs and hearts and kidneys, cannot readily be replaced. And unfortunately, there are examples in the literature already of lethal or severe toxicity that has occurred from inadvertent targeting of heart and liver with these CAR cells. Next slide, please. The next problem is a physiological one. So you heard and saw some very elegant slides on the tumor microenvironment. And suffice it to say that the microenvironment of solid tumors, such as lung cancer, unfortunately for us as people desiring to treat this disease, is far more complex than that of hematological tumors. So there is a soup of immunosuppressive speed bumps that get in the way of getting these cells into tumors and allowing them to kill tumors in the way that they do, for example, with circulating B cells. Next slide. So in conclusion, a variety of novel so-called engineered antibodies are under development, and there are no compelling efficacy data to date, and we already know that lung cancer is not lymphoma. These therapeutic vaccines continue to evolve, but expectations need to be tempered. The DNA vaccines are very interesting, and there is, in fact, early evidence of efficacy in cervical cancer. And novel uses of these vaccines may include priming, priming that will include uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Cellular therapies are very complicated. Target selection is a huge problem. There are unique challenges in solid tumors. And I think we need to manage high patient expectations that are driven by uh, Forbes and Time Magazine cover articles. Thank you very much.